Hello and welcome to the New Jersey Nursery and Landcape Association show. Growing Green. Dot on tonight's show we will be visiting one of NJNLA Fetord member, Plainview Growers in Alamuchi, New Jersey. Dot we will also be back at Fernbrook Nursery to hear more about trees from owner, Larry Cuser. and today we are at Plainview Growers and I just think it's amazing what happens behind the scenes when you start looking at various annuals being grown, succulents being grown, tropicals being grown. It's a whole new world and it's, I think it's important to really understand the whole business behind what goes into that plant when you go to that garden center. What is, what, how long does it take to make that plant and what is it that has the thought process, the soil, the timing, the whole business end of growing annuals. And right behind me to the left, you can see one of the boom sprayers actually going over. And notice there's no one operating that boom sprayer. It's entirely done by computer setup. So, uh, so today we'll be looking at the, the business and the sort of, I would say fun, because it's obviously something I'm very attracted to, but it would be the, um, the business of growing annuals. So right now we're with George Cozzolino. He is the head grower here. So everything that you see under these 10 to 12 acres is his responsibility. Yes. The uh, first time I saw you, he was running. He had something to do. He had a place to go. So, uh, so there's a little bit of pressure behind this or is this a lot of fun for you? Um, there's a little bit of pressure, but... Um, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah mostly yeah. exciting. Yeah, no, and I would say so as we're looking at the plants in front of us, what are we looking at right here? Um, this is Echeveria, uh, it's a succulent. Um, it's one of our new product lines, and um, it's a plant that basically uses uh, or re reduced amount of watering for the homeowner. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to choose varieties that will have shelf life and um, maintain it in their home for a period of time. Okay, so how long does it take to come from so I, I assume we're starting with a plug? Yep, with these? no, we're starting with, uh, we, we start our own uh, liners. So this is coming from a cutting. Okay. And the cutting is uh, depending on the time of year. Um, and we do things in weeks. So it would be roughly about eight to 12 weeks, um, different times of year it changes. That's the liner production. Okay. And then from production of liner to finish, the, uh, that would change also depending on the time of year and uh, we're talking about eight to 14 weeks. Okay, so we're looking at uh, approximately six months, yes. give or take, to go from a liner cutting from to a, cutting to to a, a finished, finished product, product. Out the door. Okay, and how many times, because this is what really amazes me, how many times would this product be handled before it goes out the door? Um, it would be handled as a cutting, uh, put into a liner, from that point, it is handled uh, from the liner to transplant, mm -hmm. and then from a transplant uh, into the pot to picked up shipping and out the door. So roughly six times. Once, twice, four times. Four times. So four times. So that's one of the, the things that really makes it impressive, because in a lot of operations, it's, it's being moved around constantly, whereas here, it's you know reducing the amount of times you handle it allows it to be a much more efficient production. So, uh, and, and as we look above us, it's not just what's on the ground, there's hanging baskets above us. Correct. And uh, so again, you're not, you're not letting any space go to waste. Correct. So that's, I think, and how are these watered above us? These are watered through emitters or a drip irrigation system. Okay. And um, basically it's on a timer and depending on how much um, light we get in temperature and reduced uh, humidity, the amount of watering is determined and then that product gets the amount, correct amount of water. Okay, okay. And they're fertilized with the water? Correct. Okay. And if, when you look at the hanging basket versus the echeveria below us, I would assume that the, the need for fertilizer varies dramatically between the crops. Uh, correct. Each of the crops depends on 
Each of the varieties will depend on um, what type of fertilizer we are using. We kind of have, um, would you say, a, a straight type of fertilizer or a, a middle of the road type of fertilizer. And then depending on the plant might get a little bit more of something and a little less of something. Okay. And that will usually keep everything simple. And because that's... The, we don't want to have too many types of fertilizer. Sure. And all of that's in your head? Yes. Wow, that's impressive. So see, this man is a walking encyclopedia of plant growth. So that's, that's why he's essential to this. So uh, I think that's really important <laughs> and very cool. So another question I always have is, I noticed as we were walking throughout, some of the plants are on top of white trays. Yes. And I'm assuming that's to reflect the sunlight, but maybe I'm totally wrong. And so why would they be on a white tray and we're standing on a black uh, fabric? Um, the white tray is, um, it's a watering tray. So oh. we, it's a spacer tray also. So we put the product on the spacer tray and then when we water it, um, it reduces, there's no waste of water. It literally goes over to that pot and into a dish. And the dish is a collection and then that water is um, then absorbed by that pot. Where a succulent is not needing that much water. Okay, yes. Um, this crop that we're watering right now is probably watered 10 days ago. Oh. the last time oh. and um, from transplant to out the door is maybe four waterings okay uh, the, it's really um, a drier crop that is a, a product that just requires watering probably every two days and to reduce uh, waste and to put the fertilizer where it needs to go we use spacer dishes very good so uh, no that was one thing that always intrigued me so uh, but I appreciate your time. I mean, you're, we could walk here, we could be two more hours talking. So, uh, <laughs> so this is, you know, because obviously I'm passionate about plants, but thank you for taking the time today to talk about how you, and again, it's not just about growing the plants, but it's how they are environmentally sensitive while doing so. So I think that's extremely important as the industry moves forward. So thank you, George, for you're talking welcome. today. Thank you. So we've moved to another greenhouse, George, and uh, obviously this greenhouse has a lot of color. Uh, one of the things about succulents, obviously, that there is a lot of green in succulents, whereas what we're surrounded by now is just profuse color. Uh, is this sun patients that we're in front of right now? This is New Guineas. New Guineas, okay. And those are sun patients to your left. The product okay. is very similar. Mm -hmm. It's just that one can handle full sun and one is a more of a shade plant. Okay, okay. And I noticed that there's a blue tag in it, which has, uh, from what we were chatting about before, a lot of information on it about the crop. Uh, but could you just, how much longer before this crop here, how long has it been here roughly, and how long before it goes out the door? This will probably leave here in about a week to 10 days, I would say. Um, it's been here for approximately two weeks. Two weeks, okay. So about three weeks to go from uh, cutting to out the door. Uh, on this this time on of this year. Product, this yeah, this, time of year. Yeah, okay. this time of okay. year. So, and the other thing, because obviously it's rather warm today, uh, I noticed that the vents up top are open. Yes, correct. Uh, and this is a really unique greenhouse that you typically don't see. So could you talk a little bit about what we're looking at above us here? Sure, this is what we call open roof um, greenhouse. And what the vents are uh, designed to um, open direct so the full air comes in. Okay. Uh, what we're looking at is, this is glass. Um, it comes in different styles but this is um, an open roof peak and what it's doing is we have also shade systems in there and a heat retention curtain so if the light levels get excessive okay. uh, we will pull a, a shade and that will reduce the light inside of the greenhouse okay and then there's another shade that mm -hmm. is a heat retention curtain and that is used in the winter time mm -hmm. to keep energy in for efficiency impressive and I would assume then that the lights which are overhead are also for growing during the winter? Correct. What we're doing is uh, manipulating um, long and short days. Okay. So certain amount of our crops require long days, certain crops require uh, a shorter day, but uh, we're trying to just maximize everything by tricking it. Tricky. Yep, yep. And I would assume uh, by short day, you're referring to chrysanthemums or something like that for the fall? Uh, correct. Okay, correct. okay. Yep. So, so again, all of this, what we see here would be in a few, how long did before you start to switch over to another crop, you know, uh, mums per se? 
Um, it, 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 everything is seasonal, so it, it, it depends on, um, we kind of program our uh, material to have uh, specific weeks that we're aiming for. Okay. So our spring bedding is aimed for another two or three more weeks. Okay. Then we're going to go from this size pot, which mm -hmm. is to a larger pot. So we'll go to okay. summer production will be an eight inch and 12 inch production for flowering bedding or flowering pots, a right. lot more of those customers. And then we are um, changing over to the next crop will be mums, which will go outside chrysanthemums. Mm -hmm. Most of those are field production or garden mums. And um, the facility that you see right now will probably be poinsettias. Poinsettias, okay. So again, uh, the space is never without plants. It's always being used, and so they're always making use of the energy and the investment that they have. So thank you, George. This has been fascinating. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Mary here. We're here at this wonderful uh, machine here. This is a transplanting machine. It is. And your name? My name is Hector Ortiz. Okay, Hector. How long have you been doing this? Uh, about, say, like nine years now on this part of it. Yeah. So this really helps to get the product to the people quicker? Yes, it does. Okay. Yes. So explain a little bit about what, what's happening right now. Well, the transplanter picks up the, from the trays and goes right into the 804 flats. And this uh, allows us to quickly get everything, all the product out into the greenhouse so that it can be grown okay. and then shipped out. So so it's what about like a few weeks before it actually gets into this one here and then it gets put into the other ones to go out to the stores, right? Yeah, in a couple of weeks and it will be out in the greenhouse and then it goes shipped right out. Okay, yeah. very good. Very cool. And I see it's also being watered at the same time. Yeah, we have the water tunnel over there and people fixing whatever the machine doesn't really pick up right. So, um, yeah. That's okay. how it goes. So tell me anything else about this machine. This is like really advanced, correct? Yeah, it's a pretty good machine. Um, the other one is a wireless, which is even more advanced. Okay. But yeah, it is a pretty good machine. So right now we're in the shipping department and it's like a warehouse. I mean, everything is lined up specifically to go on individual trucks. It's amazing. So Ben is in charge of making sure everything goes on the right truck, right? That's correct. That's correct. Is it a high pressure job? I would say so. Okay. Yes. So, uh, and he used to have blonde hair. Now look what happens. So, <laughs> but, now, uh, now, it's, now it's slowly disappearing. Slowly disappearing. <laughs> I, 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 I feel for you. So, uh, so explain what we're doing here. What's, what's happening? How, what's, how's the process go? Well, right here we got a full truck. Right here we got a full truck loaded with uh, product heading to Wegmans. And then over here we got all the trucks staged that are leaving tonight as well. So how many trucks a day would you say go in and out of this one bay? Uh, this one bay, I would say anywhere from five to 10, but at night we load usually around 15 to 20 trucks and trailers. Okay, that's impressive. And they're all loaded to the tail pretty much, you would say? Yes, yeah. always full. Always full, that's important. Do you do multiple stops? Yes. Yes, yep. okay. Some, driver, I, I, some drivers get one stops, others get four or five, depends on how many okay. orders we okay. got it Okay, okay. So, and uh, the concept is, is that as this truck leaves, then another one just backs up right in its exactly. spot. Exactly, yep. And the plants that are behind the cov uh, the camera will go right onto that truck. That's correct. That is awesome. So, it's all, it's, a, it's down to a science how it's on. And yep. then how do you know what carts are going to be lined up here to go on this truck? Well, I get all the information from logistics. Okay. And then he, he tells me how many trucks and which trucks are leaving and what goes in each truck so then I can... I give the, all the schedules to the, the ladies and the, and the guys, and they sort it all out and park it, and then as soon as the trucks roll in, we got to get them loaded out and get them out. So the point, there's another whole department, logistics, which takes care of making sure everything fits together here. So it's, it's, it's really a fine-tuned process, but again, it's not something that you sort of understand or appreciate when you're a garden center. So thank you, Ben, for explaining this. This no is problem. awesome. I really enjoy this. Thank you. Hey, Mary Tabbitt, I'm here at Plainview Growers with the owner, and your name, sir? Is Ari Van Voet. Okay. Your place is amazing, and when I first walked through your doors, I thought I was like in New York somewhere. 
Yeah. So beautiful, beautiful um, presentation. Thank you. And um, I know you service a lot of different businesses. And uh, do you want to share some of that? Sure. Um, yeah, this is our Alamucci, uh, New Jersey location. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have another location in Pompton Plains, New mm -hmm. Jersey. Okay. Actually, that's where we started the company, was in Pompton Plains. Mm -hmm. And in, two, in, in 1997, we built this location. Um, and we've, started, we've, we've expanded now for those last years. And um, we are uh, growers that actually are growing um, all types of products. For the for the garden, mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, indoor green plants, uh, we do hardy mums. Uh, we actually grow succulents. We do orchids. Uh, we grow bedding plants for spring this time of the year. Mm -hmm. um, so we and we service uh, a broad uh, customer base. We actually have a, do internet business, which we service one eight hundred flowers. Oh. And we do um, uh, we, we service the garden centers. We service the big box stores. Not all, like not not the Lowe's or the Home Depot's, but we we'll do the Costco and we we'll do most of the supermarkets. Mm -hmm. um, and over the years, we've you know we've come to put together a uh, a company here now that is uh, yeah has been successful to this point. And growing and growing every and growing, day, right? And growing every day, that's so for sure. So you're not here alone. I know you have some family members that are also part of your business. That's correct. Right. We have um, well, my wife and I have six children mm -hmm. and the uh, four boys and two girls mm -hmm. and the four sons are actually working in the company with me and this you just didn't start this like you know just recently I mean you've been in this business field for a long time can I you have. share a little bit about that sure um, basically my, my parents they immigrated from Holland mm -hmm. and they came to New Jersey uh, they began uh, their his my dad's career basically in vegetable farming field vegetables mm -hmm. Um, but over the over the years, in the 19, early 60s, he began growing uh, plants, and from that point, it just evolved into this what we have today, in 2021. Um, they started with just a few plants in the house, and now we have actually our company actually covers about 24 acres of greenhouse. Wow! Yeah. So, um, yeah, and I started my company individually here uh, in two th or eight. Um, sorry, but in uh, uh, 1986. Oh wow. 86, and um, yeah, we started with my wife and I, and one employee was about 12 years old, <laughs> and here we are today. Which our are. company is, um, we are about 150 employees, and we service uh, we service a lot of the U.S. And going through your place, I mean, everybody seemed to be so happy working. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I know that that's part to you as well for being yeah. so involved in the business um, and there's uh, the, the plant the transplanting machine that mm -hmm. really uh, was amazing yeah that's right? the, yeah that's the whole automation part of our business has really become a uh, an essential part of our business uh, with the size that we are and the amount of product that we actually produce mm -hmm. we really could not do without any of the automation that's true uh, so and now even in our industry uh, most of it, a lot of it comes from Holland. Mm -hmm. um, it, that's a big piece of um, their economy is horticulture. Um, so being in such a big piece of the economy, they are actually, you know, they're, they're producing equipment now to really automate this industry. And now they're using robotics, um, just as in the car industry, mm -hmm. with the robots with the, you know, the Y, X axis and mm -hmm. all of those type of robots. Um, and that's where we hope to also in the future, uh, once we go through into expansion that we're planning, to incorporate all of that automation into our company. That's amazing. Have you been back to Holland at all to? Uh, yeah, we yeah? usually go back every year. Um, yeah. And but now with COVID, obviously, right, right. a year and a half, we've gone basically nowhere. Right. So, yeah. And we're glad that it's uh, pretty much that's for sure. getting over with. That's for sure. But I have to say, though, with the through the COVID, through the pandemic, um, our industry Great. has thrived. Yes. I mean, it truly has. I mean, so many of the people were home, and really they just you know spent time in their home, spent time in their gardens, and we could actually really see a major increase in our industry and Absolutely. in our business. Thank you so much for sharing and having us come out to see your, your place. Well, it, it, it's amazing. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. 
Ari, this has been a phenomenal visit. I mean, I've uh, obviously, as you know, I, I live around the corner, but right. I've seen this place go up, but to actually get in here, to see yeah. your operation, to see how clean it is, I mean, it's meticulous, yeah. and how you uh, stage everything, it's awesome. Well, I appreciate that, Bruce, and we enjoy the visit, and hopefully you can get by again. You live so close, you can stop by anytime. Well, thank you for the All invitation. Right. You bet, you got it. Good afternoon, my name is John Bellaney, owner of Bellaney Contracting Company. I'm a certified nursery and landscape professional and proud member of the New Jersey Nursery and Landscape Association. Today I'm at the beautiful Pinelands Nursery in Columbus, New Jersey. That's right, New Jersey, the Garden State. I get asked many questions concerning my industry and the question that comes to mind today is a warranty question. What is your warranty? What is your warranty concerning plants? What is your warranty concerning hardscaping? More importantly, it's not just the term, it's of how long your warranty is for, but what does it cover? For plants, it should be a minimum of one year. It should include the plant and labor. For hardscaping, it should be a minimum of three years. Cover settling, expansion, or just deformity in, in, in any way, shape, or form. Make sure you hire a professional. Thank you for listening. Have a great day. If you have a question for a pro, email it to growinggreenaskapro at gmail.com. If your question is selected, you'll receive a Plant Something t-shirt from NJNLA. Larry? Thank you, Bruce. So we saw in the containers, when we put a tree in a container and we're cutting the roots and doing all that, a lot of this is making the roots more compact, more fibrous, so when you dig the tree and you move it, um, that it's going to survive. Obviously, that's what you want to happen. Now, the size of the root ball, how wide the root ball is and everything has to do with the caliper of the tree. So you have handy little calipers that are measuring in inches, so you go down here six inches off the ground. You don't measure it up here, you don't measure it on the ground, six inches above the ground, unless it's over four inches in diameter, in which case you go one foot off the ground. So that's how you measure it. So this measures two and a half inch caliper, that has to be in a 28 inch basket which means the diameter on the outside is 28 inches. Now, we're cutting off roots. Think about how a tree grows. The roots we always say go out to the drip line. Well what does a drip line mean? So a drip line, actually I'm standing by myself, I can breathe. So, yay! <laughs> <laughs> so a drip line, think of it as if you took a tree or a shrub, threw a plastic sheet over it, where would the water drip if it rained? So where does it drip? It drips way out there. So if you've got a tree that has branches that go out five or six feet, those roots go out five or six feet in every direction and maybe they go 10 or 12 feet out in each direction. So when we dig the tree, we're cutting off all those roots. This tree probably had roots that came out as far as me. All those roots were cut off. They are the feeding roots. So what does feeding roots mean? So roots absorb nutrients in the soil on the tips of the roots, all right? Just like when you have a branch, you know, all along the branch, you have other branches and leaves. So that root tips are what absorb the moisture and all that kind of stuff. It's like, I always make the analogy that if you're hungry and you wanna eat a sandwich, you could take a sandwich and hold it against your stomach. Your stomach's right there. You're really close. Hold the sandwich against your stomach. You'll starve to death. How do you eat the sandwich? You gotta put it in your mouth. The root is the same thing. It's gotta go into the mouth of the root. And the root is the root tips. So when we dig this, 
and cut all these roots off, we're cutting off, believe it or not, typically 70 to 75 percent of the tips of the roots that feed that plant. Here's an example. Here's an old root mass. All right. This is a root mass, and actually, um, Bruce, I may ask you to come over here. I put my mask back on, and you could hold the microphone while I do some of this stuff. So here we go. If you can hold the microphone for me. So now, here's here's a root mass of a tree that this was actually a sugar maple that obviously it's pretty dried out. But you can see some of these roots go out, what's that, three, four feet from here? If we dig this, we put it in this basket. There you go. This root mass has to fit in that basket. So that gives you an idea of how many roots we cut off. We're cutting these roots way back in here, way back in here. And remember, this solid part of the here, that's not absorbing any nutrients. It's only on these tips, these little hair roots. This root is broken off. That could have gone out there another two feet. So we're cutting all those roots off. And yet the tree survives. Amazing. Nature does very well. What's the bottom line? The bottom line for you is the caliper of this. Let's look at this again. Here's the caliper, six inches up. It's a little over two and a half inches. You need to provide water and care and nutrients for a tree one year for every caliper inch. So that means if this is two and a half inch caliper, for two and a half years, you need to water the tree and take care of the tree because it's gonna take two and a half or three years for all these roots to get back to where they would have been had we not cut them all off, all right? Now what is a landscape contractor? Some of them guarantee things for six months, some people guarantee things for a year, but it's your job to make sure that plant gets watered for however many years. If you get a great big tree, like a five or six inch caliper tree, you said that you're from Halka Nurseries, they go seven and eight inch caliper trees, you can be seven and eight years where you have to keep watering that tree and feeding that tree so those roots can regenerate because we cut 70%, 70%, we cut them off. So this, we got this machine here behind me. I can take this, I think. This machine, this digs, this digs, so these spades go down in the ground, digs a root ball, picks it up, takes it over, puts it inside this wire basket. And as I say, so when these spades go down in the ground, they cut all those roots off. Cut them all off, and then you get a root ball like those behind me here. So, when it comes to doing all this and understanding it, it's just how much care you need to give to your trees. They'll do all the rest. Nature will take care of it, but you got to do that. So you have choices to make. Mm -hmm. You have the power. As I said before, you have the power to make a difference. You have a power to save the songbirds. You have the power to save the environment. You have the power to reverse global warming. And this isn't just conjecture. This isn't just people talking. This is science. We now have some answers. We know what's going on. We need to stop the food deserts. We need to provide the kinds of trees that will support the birds, support the caterpillars, and it's a whole chain. It's not just 
you know, we're not just fixing butterflies or we're not just fixing hummingbirds. We're taking care of the whole picture. So you want to add anything to that, Bruce? I think that was an amazing demonstration on what happens to trees. And it's, yeah, and it's, a, it's an important thing for people to understand because we don't understand what happens underground. So Larry, thank you so for, very, very much for this very informative welcome. afternoon. Very welcome. It's a fun business. I love it. And may you all keep it going.